We're here with Derek Thompson, author of Hitmakers and the senior editor at The Atlantic. Derek, welcome. Thank you. First off, quickly, your background, because you look, and I'm sure you've heard this before, you look like you're 14. So <laughs> where, how did you get here? So Hitmakers is a book that I wrote, uh, came out last year. Uh, mm -hmm. Paperback just came out about uh, three months ago. Mm -hmm. And it's a book about the science of why we like what we like. Um, to sell something uh, familiar, you want to make it surprising. But to sell something surprising, That's you want sure. to make it familiar. When Spotify was debuting, um, was working on the app that became Discover Weekly, you know, it's really popular download of 30 new songs every single week. When they were testing that app internally at first, they wanted it to be all surprising songs by all new artists. But there was a bug in the algorithm that accidentally let slip through some old familiar songs. So they fixed that bug and they kept testing it internally. And after they fixed the bug, engagement with the app plummeted. It turned out that a few familiar songs in that discovery app made the app more popular. So again, to sell something surprising, the key was to make it familiar. So what if you look at um, products out there, media vehicles out there, can you give us examples of things that you think are going to be very successful and not so successful based on your theories? Yeah. Well, I think that one of the things I think is really important um, in, that, I, that I talk about over and over in the book is the power of distribution. Mm -hmm. Because there are some companies that are really, really great content companies. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't matter if you've made the best documentary, the best song, the best app. No one's going to find out about it. So when I look at who's going to be successful in the future, the first question that I ask is, who has the power of distribution? Right now, you see in streaming, of course, Netflix has the power of distribution. So it frankly doesn't even matter that a lot of their programming is like B minus C plus. They own distribution, and that's why they're worth 95% of Disney right mm -hmm. now. I look at a company like Amazon. Amazon's prime is in I don't know what percent of households. with two over thirds. Two thirds of households. So they own the pipeline, yeah. the metaphorical pipeline yeah. to these people's houses. And that means that they have the power to build a lot of products on top of that. Mm -hmm. So even though their programming to date has been really, really bad for video, mm -hmm. um, I think that because they own the distribution, it's given them the confidence to now spend a lot of money on surefire hits. That's why they spent a quarter of a billion dollars uh, on the rights to uh, J.R. Tolkien's uh, books mm -hmm. because they essentially see that we own the distribution. Once we have any content that has the potential to be a hit, we have the power to so put it So you're a distribution, content. not a content guy because there's definitely two camps, right? And I, I just had lunch with a guy who's at a company called, I think it's called Real Vision or Real Video, and their viewpoint is that great content, you'll be able to find distribution. Your, your point is you gotta start with the distribution. Well, my point is that is that a lot of content people mm -hmm. uh, radically downplay distribution. And actually that we, the media, have given them permission to do so. Because we have taught them this lesson of virality. We've mm -hmm. bought into this viral myth. And when you believe that a piece of content can just go viral, that gives you an excuse to not work on a marketing and distribution play for it. If you say, I've, already, I've made the greatest app, I've written the greatest song, and you believe in the viral myth, then you just believe this thing is like the measles and it should just take off and infect everybody automatically. But time and time again, what we've seen in, th in pop culture history is that that doesn't happen. Some of the most successful songs, in fact, failed over and over again until they found the right distribution platform. A great example would be Rock Around the Clock. Rock Around the Clock is the second best-selling song of all time. It's the first rock and roll hit to ever hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100. And when it came out in 1950... Bill Haley in the comments? That's right, Bill Haley in Boom. his comments. Boom! Well done. When it came out in 1954, it was an utter failure. Right. It was a total dud. And <laughs> through an incredible series of events, the director of a movie called Blackboard Jungle, kind of one of these juvenile delinquency films... Sidney Poitier? Uh, he was in it. Wow, look at you. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm yeah. just really... F Oh. <laughs> um, he goes to his star's house, yeah. Glenn Ford, yeah. and he says, Glenn, I want a song to kick off this movie. What do you got? Mm -hmm. And Glenn Ford says, you know, uh, my favorite kind of music is Hawaiian folk, so that's mm -hmm. not going to be very helpful for scaring people about the problem of juvenile delinquency. But my 10-year-old son, Petey Ford, listens to this new race music. Maybe you should ask him. So the director of Blackboard Jungle, Richard Brooks, goes to this 10-year-old boy, Peter Ford, and says, Show me the songs that you have. Give me some vinyl records. And Peter Ford gives him a stack of vinyl records that includes Rock Around the Clock. Mm -hmm. And it's only after Rock Around the Clock plays at the beginning of Blackboard Jungle that it soars to number one of the charts and becomes essentially the hit that all of us know. 
So again, if you're a content person, mm -hmm. if you say content is king and content is destiny, you can't explain the story. Because Rocker on the Clock sounded the exact same in 1954 when it was a dud, and in 1955 when it was the hit of the century. The difference was context and distribution. So again and again, I just think it's so important to think, once you've made something great, mm -hmm. you're halfway done. Uh, Disney, Netflix, Amazon, those are easy. Give us some media companies that you think will be hits and why that everyone's on. I mean, uh, Axios and Quartz, how are they going to do? I think an interesting thing about Axios mm -hmm. is that one of the things that sets it apart mm -hmm. is the fact that it has breaking news that cable news networks want to talk about, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a new media company. You want to get scoops. And you're like, and you're like yeah. how do I, I co-opt the distribution that already exists? Mm -hmm. How do I co-opt mm -hmm. the attention platforms that already exist? The best idea is to say, I'm going to produce content that is catnip for cable news networks. Because I can put all of my reporters mm -hmm on those news networks and get the name out there. Axios, Axios, yeah, Axios, all that, over. Right, yeah. And they do that. And so I think that in many ways, it's a really, really great sort of post-advertising business model. It's a great marketing strategy to essentially say, where are all the people looking that we want to reach? All right, now let's find a way to co-op those networks so that like, the people who own those distribution networks want us to reach them. So does Spotify break through? How does Spotify, just recently public, is it a buy or does it screw it even with a better product because it can't get distribution? Spotify is a buy, but not because of its current business model, yep. because of its possible business model. Its current business model is essentially constructed so that Spotify basically has to lose money because mm -hmm. it's basically a co-op that is co-owned by the music labels, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's why it's so difficult to make money under the current model. But what does Spotify have? They have distribution. They have tens of millions of people who adore the product, who mm -hmm. have it at the bottom of their phone on the most valuable real estate in media. Yeah. So why not build other products on top of that? Why not make Spotify a natural home for new video products? Mm -hmm. I think that is where you're going to see them push the company now that they're public. I think that's, that's, that's where they're going to move the next three years. And I think they absolutely have the potential to use the distribution network that they've already built and then put in for profit or higher margin products on top of that. So you said Amazon or Netflix versus Disney. I always thought that the celebrity death match was gonna be Amazon versus Netflix. Do you think it's Disney versus Netflix? I think, well, it's interesting. So Amazon, I absolutely consider to be a company with enormous potential in video, but I'm mm -hmm. also not entirely sure what their video strategy is at the moment because it's in such a U-turn. Like for a long time, it seemed like they were really focusing on like indie darlings and mm -hmm. like sort of optimizing for Oscars, which is not a mass media play for, you know, the, the biggest e-commerce e company in the world. So I was confused by that strategy, but it definitely seems like we've hit an inflection point where now they're spending a billion dollars on hits, on like, like Tolkien-style hits. So if they do that, if they reorient around a Disney-style strategy, buy up all of the available, most valuable IP, and then just churn out sequel by sequel and spin-off by spin-off, given that IP, that's the strategy, right? So Amazon essentially is trying to be Disney. Well, Disney tries to be Netflix, right? Disney essentially has all the content you could possibly hope for. They have that incredible cata uh, catalog um, Kids, of animated sports. stuff. They have Lucas Films. They've got Star Wars and Indiana yeah. Jones. They've got Pixar. They've got Marvel, which is just this this factory of of, uh, of film hits. But what they don't have is is streaming distribution. Like that's the thing that they have to build. And I do think that we're in a position right now where if Disney builds a halfway decent distribution product for streaming, it is going to be really, really tough news for Netflix for two reasons. First, I just think Disney's content is a lot better. So once you equalize in distribution, then you have to uh, give it to Disney on content. Second, like look at, Netflix, at Netflix's stock right now. It's 95% it's as valuable as Disney even though its profits are like one-tenth of Disney's, even though it like basically is spending, it, is, it could very well like lose money this year. And it's, it seems to be sort of tr like using a Jeff Bezos strategy in order to grow, but television shows and warehouses are not that similar. So like if you overspend in a television show right now, that's not very good. By 2020, what's the value of that television show? Basically zero. You can count the number of people who are going to be watching it on two hands. When Amazon spends a lot of money and pushes down their, their profits, as we've talked about, 
you know, the, the warehouse that they're building in like, you know, suburban New York or suburban Cincinnati, that warehouse is going to be just as valuable, if not more valuable in 2020. So it's weird to me that Netflix is essentially using an Amazon model for a non-Amazonable business. And I, I, I'm nervous about the future of their business because there's going to be a future where they're essentially neck and neck with Disney, but Disney obviously has the profits and the content and the IP, and Netflix just has sort of the legacy signups for the product. When you talk about Disney needs the distribution or they need the technology or the streaming, aren't, you, aren't we really saying Nis Disney needs to, to cross the chasm and go to a different business model? I mean, they already have the technology. It's about moving from a business model where they give get a ton of affiliate fees and a lot of advertising and moving to a Netflix model where they charge $9.99 a month and literally forego billions in advertising and affiliate fees. And it's sort of what, almost what, um, was it Macrame, Adobe did, where they said instead yeah, of absolutely. selling stuff at $1,299, right. we're going to go $29.99, and their profits went like this. Right. And then they came back, but they came back as a recurring revenue model, which has a greater multiple. It's hard for those companies to do that. It, it feels like Bob Iger is one of the few people that can pull it off, but it's it's not as much di it's not as much technology and distribution. They need the stones to go to a, an entirely different Netflix like business model. No. Yeah. No. There's there's content. There's distribution. And there's stones. And uh, I think that's I think that's a great way to put it. I mean, let me make the bear case for Disney and mm -hmm. and with with the bull. The bear case is that Disney had all of these moats, and the moats are now flooding the fairy tale castle. Like they used to be the number one uh, 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 sort of pay TV um, television company. And now half of people between the age of 22 and 45 didn't watch any pay TV in 2017. So that model is collapsing. Um, you look at movies. On the one hand, like they, I think, have made eight of the 12 biggest movies of the last decade. But at the same time, the number of 18 to 24 year olds who are going to the movies every year has declined by 17% in the last five years. So all of the moats are flooding the castle, right? There's lots of reasons why you should be a, a, a bear on Disney. At the same time, a Disney streaming product, a Disney flicks, has the potential to be so much bigger than Netflix. Because when Netflix is, what Netflix is selling you is just video. They're just selling you that one hour that you're watching. Mm -hmm. But the genius of Disney, going all the way back to Walt Disney, has always been the understanding that the ultimate value of their company is in the power to merchandise fantasy, to take the fantastical experience of that movie, that television show, and turn it into a blanket, a theme park ride, an experience. And so Disney flicks won't just be Netflix for Disney. Mm -hmm. It is the potential to be Amazon for Disney, Kayak for Disney, uh, Groupon for Disney. Yeah, access they, to parks, access if to If they cruises. know that you love yeah. Frozen, then they're yeah. going to be the best company in the world that's saying, we know that your kid loves Frozen because mm -hmm. he or she has watched it 17 times in the last 24 days. Maybe he or she, maybe your little kid wants a, a blanket, a pillow, yeah, a, a mug. We'll Disney, give you a 30% yeah. discount to go to Frozen in New York City. Yeah. And that's how Disney essentially, I think, becomes not just the Netflix of entertainment, but mm -hmm. the Amazon. Disney Prime, I think, is what we're looking at. What if Time Warner and Disney got together and they merged and started a competitor to Netflix? Well, the thing that I definitely don't understand, and it's, a, it's, it's sort of a separate issue, but I think it's so interesting, is we're at a period right now where throughout sort of antitrust history, mm -hmm. um, the DOJ has always blocked the horizontal mergers and been relatively kind to vertical mergers. But right now we're in a scenario where AT&T and Time Warner, clearly a vertical merger, is now being blocked by the government. But Disney and Fox, a horizontal merger, that, which has That's always right. gotten scrutiny, make any is sense. basically getting the green light. You had this fascinating theory that we went over the last time we were together where you said that the best thing that happened to Google and Facebook was Netflix. Can you expand on that? Sure. Um, you know, let's go back to uh, the year 2000. Let's say mm -hmm. that Google and 2004, let's say, so Facebook exists. And Google and Facebook get together um, in a sort of cigar smoke filled room and they say, what can we do to optimize the value of our business in 20 years? And what they would say, I think, as they were chomping their cigars is, we need to build some corporate shell that d somehow destroys the pay TV business model, that gets a bunch of people to keep watching video, but all that video is ad free. And once television goes from a dual revenue business model of both affiliate fees and advertising to a one revenue business model, which is just subscription fees, 
$40 billion of advertising that previously went to television will be freed up and it, there will be nowhere else for it to go but online where we, Google and Facebook, will be the duopoly, right? So that's the end of that you know, make-believe scenario. That company exists. It's Netflix. Netflix is almost single-handedly leading the effort to destroy the pay TV business model in the United States. I just gave you the stat that uh, uh, 50 percent of Americans between the ages of 22 and 45 didn't watch any pay TV last year. Um, that is just remarkable. You are just seeing the, a calamity uh, in, in the pay TV market. And as a result, all that advertising is being freed up. And the only place for it to go is Google and Facebook. Google and Facebook accounted for 99 percent of, ad, of digital advertising growth in 2016. So Facebook and Google could not have come up with a more ingenious corporate assassin than Netflix. Mm -hmm. And the, the thesis of this, of this story is that the biggest winner of Netflix versus the cable bundle is not Netflix, it's certainly not the cable bundle, it's Google and Facebook. So let's make some uh, predictions here. What media company do you think um, increases its value the most in, say, the next 12 to 36 months? As long as the market is just going to judge Netflix and mm -hmm. subscription numbers, I see no reason to bet against Netflix mm -hmm. in, in the next 12 months. But 12 months from now, there's going to be a Disneyflix product. And what I think Disney will do eventually, maybe not in 36 mm -hmm. months, but certainly in 48 months, mm -hmm. is they're going to take one of these films like Black Panther and they're going to say, folks, the only way, the yeah. only way that you can watch this movie. Or Star Wars. Or Star, certainly Star Wars. A yeah. movie like, like Solo would be a great example. Yeah, yeah. The only way that you can watch Solo 2 or yeah. Leia is to become a Or offered net seven days early in your home. Right, right exactly. Right. Is yeah. to become a Disney yeah. Flix subscriber. Yeah. What you're going to see in that scenario is that the earnings report in, say, 20, late 2019, early 2020, is going to show 10 million to 15 million people have signed up for this Disney product. Yeah. And that moment, that day, if you time it right, you're going to make, if you own face, uh, Disney stock, an enormous amount of money. Because yeah, suddenly- yeah, ugly for Netflix to- Right, people's eyes are gonna open up and they're gonna say, this is not a monopoly anymore. This is a, a two-man yeah. race and Disney could win it. Netflix, great short term, kind of medium term. You're betting on Disney with their Disney flicks. Any other observations around me media companies that you think are gonna ascend or descend really quickly in the next 24 months? The low-hanging fruit for Spotify is just there. I mean, Spotify So you're not worried has... about Amazon Music or Apple Music using no. their distribution to come after Spotify? I'm a, I'm a little worried uh, for precisely the antitrust mm -hmm. reasons that you pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, my expectation is, my, my hope in this sort of argument about being a, a Spotify bull mm -hmm. is that we are in an environment right now that is more antitrust than maybe any environment going mm -hmm. back to, I don't, I don't know, this, the 70s, the 60s. And as a result, there'll, there will be more scrutiny placed on decisions like Apple essentially enacting an Apple tax in Spotify, which should hopefully give Spotify room to breathe. Spotify is an, is an extraordinary product. Yeah. People adore it all over That's the world. Product, yeah. And it has just, I think people underrate the fact that it has the most important real estate in media, which is that for so many people, it is the part of the phone that is closest to your thumb. It's mm -hmm. right there next to texting and email and the web browser. You have distribution that other companies would murder for. I don't see how a group of smart people don't come up with a plan to monetize that by layering a higher profit, a higher, a, a higher margin product on top of music, and, and that product just has to be video. What about Hulu? Hulu's interesting because I, I don't know. I, I've talked to... Um, people at Disney about their strategy for Disney Flix versus Hulu. They're going will they, to will essentially- Will they be the same thing? They're not going to be the same thing. They'll be very different. Disney is going to be the family first streaming service and Hulu is going to be for adult entertainment. Not Stormy Daniels adult, but like, you know, Deadpool yeah, adult. Tale. The right. Handmaid's Tale, right. right. R-rated PG-13, mm -hmm. um, risky stuff. Fox Searchlight, all those Oscar films that Fox Searchlight um, has produced. Uh, uh, Isn't that confusing to the consumer though? Shouldn't they have one product and maybe they have you know, maybe they have, you know, Netflix manages to segment by genre. I have the kids, I have the other stuff. They mix the content up. I mean, wouldn't they be better off just, they have the technology. Yes. it's so make. confusing. Hulu yeah. becomes Disney flicks. This is why in, in the piece in The Atlantic where I write about Disney strategy, I say, you know, Kevin Mayer, their, their chief of strategy and now chief of, of streaming strategy, mm -hmm. has said, you know, we're all in on streaming. 
You're not all in. Not. You're all over the place. Yeah. You have a Netflix, you have a Disney Flix product. Advertising supported, ESPN right. 2, 3 with ads. and Exactly. You, you have a pay TV strategy. You have a pay TV plus strategy yeah. with like ESPN plus. Yeah. You have a family streaming strategy with Disney Flix. You have an adult streaming strategy with Hulu. I mean, this is not an all-in strategy. It's actually very, very confusing mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, if you're a 35-year-old, 45-year-old guy who you know likes who you know likes Oscar winning entertainment but also has kids they're basically making you sign up for two products that serve completely different interests you know Netflix is not going to spin off Netflix plus the stuff we think might get Emmy consideration that would be very very weird I think but Disney has essentially done that with their announcement for Hulu being an adult first entertainment product. Um, I don't think it makes any sense, and my expectation is that in 12 months they will realize the same. Derek Thompson, author of Hitmakers and senior editor at The Atlantic. Thanks very much. Thank you.